and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard, live on location here in beautiful Los Angeles, California. We have a very interesting special show that is so much we can talk about, about two gentlemen on the show that are fascinating, and I'm sure you will share the same sentiment about how fascinating their careers are and what they're doing today. But before we begin, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by iHeartRadio, where if you missed the Sherrard Show on Comcast NBC, you can always see us on iHeartRadio. Just type in The Sherrard Show. It's also brought to you by Sheska Bekska Holistic, um, Holistic Approach, where it's the holistic approach to healing you when you're sick. This is especially for ladies. Ladies, if you have particular health ailments, you can always go to Seska. You can see it on your monitor. Seska dash holistic. And this is going to allow you to be able to feel better in all the ways possible. As a matter of fact, she will be a guest on our show. Mrs. Lawanda, uh, LaShonda Williams will be stopping by the show to talk about her business on tomorrow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've all been fascinated about the mafia. We've all seen some great movies of depicting the mafia. Goodfellas, from Casino um, to Donnie Brasco and so on and so forth. But never have we have I had an opportunity to talk to two individuals who's actually lived that life and are actually doing great and big things in the film industry. And one man has even met Frank Sinatra when he was a young boy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna welcome two gentlemen to the show. First, we have Dave I, Ivan Cotty, is that correct? I Ivetti, it's okay. I Ivetti, <laughs> he stopped by the show. You got so it on pleased. the second try. That's good. It's so, so so pleased to have him on the show. Welcome to the show. How are you this evening, sir? I'm great, and I'm pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. So glad to have you. Then we have another gentleman. If you look at the view, his background, he is in Miami, living it up, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that view where he is, Mr. Ciro. And that's, let me make sure I don't butcher his last name. Is it DeBaggio? DePaggio. DePaggio. Welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. Now, you really are in a relaxed mode. What's the temperature there in Miami? Uh, 80. Oh, wow. That's very good. Well, we have... I'm sorry? 75, 80 degrees. I'm not really sure. We're living it up. Well, gentlemen, we're going to jump right into it. We have so many people uh, wanting to hear what you all have to say. I'll start with you, Dave. Dave, now you are you are affiliated with the Gambino family. You've done some things, um, um, well, you've seen some things in the industry, uh, in the mob industry, but also as well in the film industry. But let's talk about how you started off. When you were a young boy, what was it like growing up in that family? Well, again, it was my father who was really connected. I was connected through him, you might say. Um, it was like growing up in Camelot. I mean, uh, with my father, he was a capo, which is one of the bosses, and he was assigned to Florida. And basically, they um, he was the man you had to see if, if any of the underworld wanted to do anything in Florida. And that's not from me. That's from what I read in books. He's in many books in the library. And as I was growing up, I was... Um, with my little sister and my mother, she raised us while he was in um, federal prison most of my life, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I learned about my father through books in the library. And um, it was fascinating. And then when he came out, I actually got to meet the people I read about in the books. It was, it was like really fascinating to say the least. So, um, but it was like Camelot. So growing up in that life as a young boy, you really didn't know what was going on until you started reading about it in the library books? Yeah, yeah, exactly. When I was like 14 to 18, that's when I realized who my dad uh, was. <laughs> now, now I'm gonna kick it to you, Ciro. Now, um, Ciro, you, you grew up in that lifestyle as well. Now, how did you and Dave first meet? <laughs> Me and Dave known each other our whole lives. <laughs> pretty much yes there's there's some there's some things there that that we don't really discuss relationship wise that we've pretty much sworn to uh the old pops in heaven there that we'll leave at rest so that's where it'll stay but um you know me and dave we've i've known him my whole life he's my brother and and that's and that's all he says is your brother and that's all i understand as but now what was it like for you um growing up as that as dave being your brother and always having your back and then some of the experiences you've had um well as dave mentioned to you off air i was a lot more active allegedly you know his dad did a very good job of shielding him you know because that that was the apple of his eye you know accordingly 
and uh, I didn't want him really involved with any of the stuff, you know. Me, on the other hand, I was like a magnet <laughs> to the <laughs> chaos. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it was to me, it was uh, an exciting lifestyle. It's it's a it's a very exciting lifestyle until it's not, you know, and it's not when they come and take everything and lock you up for 20 years. So, you know, I would recommend try it at home. Oh, wow. Well, you got to teach me how to fold napkins. I really don't know how to fold napkins. So you gotta teach me that. <laughs> that, that, that's the extent of my, my work experience with any alleged uh, mafias or whatever. <laughs> as far as I know, that, that, that's a cheese that doesn't even exist, you know? <laughs> I love it. Now, now let's talk a little bit about the um, film industry. You know, you have a lot of familiar projects going on, um, like Mob King, for example. Everybody see that on their monitor. Uh, what inspired you all to uh, have that concept for the next big thing coming out? Well, I mean, what inspired us is we grew up in Miami around, you know, um, the hustles, you know, the street hustles. I mean, that's where that's where me and Dave, you know, got everything we've ever earned was from the dirt, you know, from from the land, learning the ways of uh, ways of making money on the street, you know. So uh, we just take those experiences, you know. South Florida is a little different than what people are accustomed to, which is why I think the shows that I've created and the shows that Dave helps me create resonate with people because um, it's different than what they've normally seen, you know. Um, now, now, Cyril, when you mean it's different, explain to me, uh, the audience, what do you mean by different in terms of that? Okay, well, you've seen The Sopranos, so you have the stereotypical New Yorkers, you know, with the with the heavy New York accent. Everybody automatically assumes every Italian talks like that, which they don't, um, you know. And uh, in South Florida, you have a melting pot of organizations, if you will, gangs, cliques especially in the heyday when we were coming up, you know, you had the eighties, there was all type of, you know, drug people that we, you know, came in contact with and may or may not have dealt with, you know, so uh, it was a wild west here in South Florida. Now, is that something that it still is today or that was when you were coming up? I have no knowledge of anything illegal. Now, now, I'm going to kick it over to you, Dave. Now, um, Dave, you have a very interesting story how you met Frank Sinatra when you were very young. What was that all about? Well, my father, you know, it's really funny. My mother's story is just as fascinating as, as my dad's. And one day, maybe we can go into that. But More she, actually, <laughs> <laughs> she actually dated Frank Sinatra uh, for two weeks. She had broken up with my father, and they wound up in Las Vegas together. And um, he asked her, where do you hang out in New York? And she goes at Jilly's in Manhattan. And Jilly's was owned by my um, father's dear friend and Frank Sinatra's right-hand man. He wasn't his right-hand man then. What happened? <laughs> my mom got back with my dad, and, and she's at the apartment in Manhattan. And somebody from Jilly's called and said, Frank Sinatra's here. He's looking for Terry, and Dave's got him in the corner talking to him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And they became best friends, and Julie became his right-hand man. And it was all because of my mother. Um, so when he was in uh, Miami while my father was in prison, which he spent 20 years like Ciro, unfortunately, of his life, um, while he was away, Sinatra was in town, and my mom called Julie and said, I'd like uh, my son to meet Sinatra and you. So Jilly's such a gentleman. He brought me to the Fountain Blue. They uh, had a wonderful chicken parmesan lunch with him and the boys. Sinatra had a headache upstairs. He couldn't come down at that time, but they go, listen, he's going to be going to the concert in two hours. Be at the back gate, and I'll make sure he meets you, and, um, you know, you see him. So I said, okay. So me and my mom and little sister waited at the back of the Fountain Blue. And as I wrote in the book, it was like the Secret Service guarding the president. The elevator doors opened. These guys in suits came out. Uh, Jilly yells, there's Dave's son. And there came Sinatra and shook my hand. He goes, how you doing, kid? And he reached down. And, and that was like meeting God in 1978. You know? Oh, I my mean, goodness. I was like, and <laughs> now, I had heard, how... heard and read in books that Sinatra didn't like anyone to call him Frank. It would upset him. And I knew this. So when he goes, how you doing, kid? I go, how you doing, Mr. Sinatra? And he loved that. <laughs> so, so he preferred you call him Mr. Sinatra instead of Francis or Frank? 
Yeah, in general, I had just read that people would come up to him in casinos or wherever they may see him. And uh, if they were lucky enough to get close to him and they'd say, hey, Frank, and he would just offended by that. If you didn't know him, the, he the, thing that, to be the thing that he disliked was when you said his first name, he felt that you should be on a personal basis with him. And just anybody hollering out his first name was inappropriate. And Dave is a little more humble when it comes to these discussions. Frank Sinatra loved Dave Jr., he wanted to adopt him from his dad. So don't let That's him fool right. you. Yeah, don't let him fool you with his humble nature about, yeah. <laughs> he was over there all the time oh, causing yeah, havoc. Yeah. <laughs> he was over there all the time causing havoc. We were over there causing havoc. And, you know, Frank, yeah. Frank, Frank loved Dave Jr. Without wow. A doubt. That is amazing. Now, did you all get a chance to meet the rest of the Rat Pack or just uh, Frank Sinatra? No. I, I didn't. I got, I, I heard stories about Sammy Davis that, you know, I love the man, so I won't repeat them. Uh, they're not that bad, but I'm sure you won't let me talk about them. Uh, uh, it was good a- things about Dean Martin. I would have loved to have met Dean Martin. I mean, I was grateful for Sinatra, but yeah, my, um, uh, my, my father told me that Sinatra wanted to adopt me when I was a child because I don't know, I was unexpected or I don't know why it was, but uh, my mother, of course, would never go for that. And I said to my dad, though, I said, why didn't you let me? He goes, I told him no. I said, why? He said, because you didn't ever talk to me again. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is fascinating um, and such an honor to have. Uh, He's the, actually the godfather of my older sister in Connecticut. He's actually her godfather per FBI files. Wow. Wow. Now, um, we're going to talk about your book in a moment. You did just mention a book. So I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but I had a question for you, Ciro. Now, Ciro, um, what kind of fascinating or or celebrities have you met being um, in the movie industry that you are in today, besides yourself? Uh, I've I've met uh, a great deal. I mean, you know, I I dated a great deal of them before I even went away, you know, so celebrities, I'm not really enamored with the whole celebrity thing. Dave will tell you, it, it, it doesn't excite me. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't, I'm not enamored by that at all. So I've met, the whole range of people, you know, um, everybody from Britney Spears to, you know, you name it, I've met them back in the day. So uh, since I've been out, I've had the privilege of working with some really good actors, you know, James Russo from Donnie Brasco and Django Unchained, um, Mike Belonga, who just won the Academy Awards for Green Book. And, um, you know, we got Gary Pastore, Joseph D'Onofrio, a whole bunch of really good actors and silent partners. So, you know, I've met a few. You know, Cyril, um, Dave sent me something so cool and, and everybody's gonna see it on the screen um, of a clip of you in a film. And it, what got me was not only the great acting of you um, in that clip, but also the song that was playing. James Brown paid the cost to be the boss, ladies and gentlemen. Paid that was a be beautiful thing. Now, tell me a bit about uh, what, we ex- what can we expect um, based upon that clip? Well, that's a Mob King clip. I don't know which it is. I can't see it, but I I know which song and what clip we did the promo with that song. So, you know, it's pretty much, um, you know, it's just the the feel that we have for Mob King is, you know, my character. I kind of come across as a throwback from another era, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I my character in Mob King doesn't acknowledge being a, a wise guy by any stretch of the imagination, but he's affiliated with all of them, you know, and it just shows how the, um, the process is, you know, maneuvering yourself within all the different organizations in South Florida. You know, that's what I meant by being different than the stereotypical stuff you're used to seeing in Casino or Goodfellas. You're used to seeing guys controlling one area of a certain block or a certain, you know, street or whatever the case may be. A crew has, you know, Mulberry Street or this street or that street, whatever, the, you know, whatever it is in New York and South Florida. It's completely different. It's, it's not like that at all. This is open territory. It's always been open territory. So you have everybody operating here from Russians to Jews to, you know, Italians, Cubans, you know, Puerto Ricans, Haitians. It's just not, it's just a melting pot. And if you don't know how to maneuver your way within these different, you know, veins of operational principles with people, then you'll end up like many of people have ended up in the streets of Miami. Wow. Wow. So now um, that's coming out. Mob Kings, um, is that out already or is that something coming soon? We release it as a um, web series, you know, when I 
I started out two, three years ago, released it as a web series. It caught fire. It has millions of views, millions of fans. And, um, you know, it got picked up by Wanda Halicon and New Street Pictures uh, International. So it's going to be filming in Spain. We would have already filmed, but COVID had everything locked down. And uh, Spain just went into lockdown again. So I came back to South Florida. I'm going to film a couple more projects while I'm here. And then uh, we'll go back over there and get that cranked up. Zero, you got to get me in one of the roles. Maybe I'll be the chauffeur. Huh? Got to get me as a chauffeur. In the <laughs> you want a driver know. car? No problem. I got you. <laughs> now, Dave, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about your book, Dave. You were mentioning a bit about your book. Tell us a little yeah. bit about the book. It's actually thanks to, I mean, I had the book started in um, skeleton form. But like many of my projects, unfortunately, life gets in the way sometimes. And it got shelved. And it didn't get picked back up. And uh, my mom was ill for a while. So for a few years, I was locked down taking care of my mom. And, uh, and then Cyril, of course, was gone at that time. And then he came home. And when he first came home, he invited me to be right on board on Mob King. But I, I had my mom and so many issues, I couldn't. So he, he went ahead and he, he made a hit out of it. And then he made the deal with uh, the European uh, company. It's actually where they're shooting is where they shoot 007 and Harry Potter was shot. It's really a great location that he's at there so it was like watching your best friend hit the lottery get on the yacht and sail out into the sunset and you're happy for him you know you're wishing him the best and then he you see the yacht turn around and come back and he goes hey dave i need another project now mom king's not mine anymore so let's do something and that's how silent partners was born so i took the skeleton of the story about my father and i wrote a book and while I was doing that, he took that same concept and made a fictional uh, series out of it, like a South Florida Sopranos, if you will, but with the Miami Vice flair from the 80s and the 90s, a beautiful thing. And you've got to see that pil uh, pilot that he has um, accomplished. So I put the book out, which is an ex historically accurate story about my father, Sinatra, me, Zero, my mother, etc., Frankie Carbo, Carlo Gambino. I mean, it's you know, fascinating stuff in there about every um, icon from that era that my father was affiliated, and he was affiliated with a lot of them. Um, but I wasn't uh, a seasoned writer, Sherard. This was my first effort, and it went to number one on Amazon oh, in organized yeah. crime biographies. It beat out Pablo Escobar's biography that came out at the same time. And, and, it was and now I'm amazed. Now, Dave, what's the title of the book? Okay, it's Silent Partners, Fat Dave Gambino Capo. So it's kind of a long name, but if you just put in Fat Dave, it'll come up. On so Amazon. everybody can see it on their screen um, for those who are watching the show. And you can purchase it at Amazon or wherever um, great books are sold. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Kindle. Okay, very outlets. good. Now, now, tell me this. Um, what is it about that life that fascinates people so much that any time a movie, new movie comes out, if it's done right, it captivates people's attention. Goodfellas came out uh, 30 years ago, but that's still one of the most uh, coveted movies to watch whenever it pops in, young and old. People who weren't even born during that time period still love that. I'll kick it to you first, Ciro. Why do you think that there's such a fascination about that lifestyle? Well, I will say this off from the start, most mob mm -hmm. movies are letdowns. So the reason why your casinos, Goodfellas, Bronx Tale, Godfather sagas rate very highly with people is because they're pretty accurate and compelling in their portrayal of the truths of the way things are allegedly done in uh, Cosa Nostra. So, you know, that's why I think it resonates. The reason why people like it is they live vicariously through these characters because they're not going to do the stuff that they see on TV, but they'll go at the water cooler and they'll say <laughs> something from the line, you know, and, and, and try to be that cool person that they watched on TV. So that's the reason why mafia shows will do well and prison shows will do well because, you know, thankfully most people don't go to prison, but normal people are captivated by prison life, you know, I've had several people tell me, oh, it's so cool. And I'll be like, there's nothing cool about prison. Absolutely nothing. You might think it's cool. You might think it's cool watching a show. But trust me, if you got to do 24 hours there, much less 20 years, you're not going to think anything about it is cool. Mercy. So I, I think that's where it comes from. People basically 
you know, for a couple of hours, live vicariously through these characters and, you know, experience something that they normally never would. Now, um, what about you, Dave? What do you think is, is such a fascination? About well, I think I, I think I know why, because, um, you know, I know why I got in that life, because I didn't have to. I was in the entertainment business, and it wasn't money. It was because I just gravitated to it because my father had been in it, I think. I don't know if it was in my DNA. But it's because, like Ciro said, I mean, it's the Robin Hood thing. These guys go out, and they do whatever they want. They answer to no one unless the government comes down on them or some other mob guy wants to rub them out because they, they're angry with, with them. But other than that, you, you live a life, and I'm glad I'm not in it now, even though the entertainment business is a lot like it, I'll tell you that, <laughs> um, uh, that very few people do. I mean, you actually you know, live. I mean, it, your life can change on a dime any day, any night. There is no set routine uh, for it. So um, that's why I think people like it is because, you know, they do what, what Cyril, like Cyril said, most people would never, ever do in reality. I want to I wanna say um, one thing about old Pop. You know, he was considered the last of the gentleman gangsters, all right? Th this man was so well respected in those circles, and the things that he taught me and Dave in retrospect about keeping things close to the vest and, you know, um, there's so little information about him because of that. And that's what's, that's what's really a, a testament to how this man operated because he was just a genius. You know what I mean? I mean, I was, I was enamored with him my whole life and uh, the opportunities he created for me were great. He always had my back and um, I came through for him and having his son's back and, you know, it just works out when you do the right things with the right people for now, Ciro, the right you reasons. Said, you said um, the last of the gentleman gangsters. Now, what does that mean? That means that he he epitomized everything that you think you that you believe a wise guy is. You know, people think they're men of respect, men of this, men of that. The reality of it is a lot of them in the past have been megalomaniacs. You know, some of them have been crazy. Some of them have not been crazy. But he is the epitome of what you would expect a wise guy to be. I mean, you know, he was everything and more of what that represents. Everything and more to the T, every single day of his life. Oh, he was wow. a great man. He was a wow. great, great man. Great man. Now, what, what year did he pass away? 98. 98. Oh, God rest his soul. God rest his soul. And now, we are, we are speaking to two very iconic individuals, um, Dave, um, who is doing big things in the industry, and we're going to talk more about that. And then as well as Ciro, who's um, relaxing there in a balcony in Miami, as you <laughs> just look at that background. It's just an incredible background, ladies and gentlemen. Um, these men. Now, you look, um, Dave, you look very familiar because I know I've seen you in a couple Netflix films. Am I correct? Well, you might have seen Club TV. I was I, I hosted that for many years. Um, it was out in Vegas, in Los Angeles, in Miami. Very popular, um, kind of an MTV type of show. Mm -hmm. we, we were up against Entertainment Tonight. But I hear that all the time from people. I look like Nick Cage. I look like Dan Marino when I had hair. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but just going back to the gangster thing, I'll just tell you this. Um, my mother did everything in her power to keep it. And the worst beating I ever got in my life, which were very few for my mother, was when she asked me at 12 years of age what, what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I said, a gangster. Because um, she knew that Bad life. answer. Bad answer. Bad answer. Bad answer. So yeah, you don't want to you don't want to get mom mad at you. <laughs> She's a tough cook, man. Yeah, she's you been know, around um, the she's been around the, the hardest of the hardest, man. And she's She's a tough cookie. I, I love her to death. She's she's amazing. Wow. Yes, she wow. That's kind of like in the Bronx tale when um he was fascinated by that life and got that beaten really bad um from his dad yeah. for uh, you know, because Robert De Niro was just trying to keep him out of that life. And right. he just was so fascinated by that. It's very interesting. Now, um, Dave, tell us about the poster that's behind you, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, well, that was one of Quentin Tarantino's first um successes. Uh, that that was the beginning was Reservoir Dogs with uh, Harvey Keitel and Quentin himself is in it as Mr. Brown and um, you have Mr. White and uh, Steve uh, Buscemi as Mr. Pink he wasn't happy about it 
And uh, it was just a tale of these gangsters that all got together to make this uh, job happen. And, of course, something went wrong, as it always does. <laughs> now, Ciro, I'm going to have a little fun, uh, you gentlemen. I'm going to ask you a few questions about a few movies that I love. And I want you to tell me, is it an accurate depiction or is it total fiction? Can we do that? Sure. Okay, let's start off with you, Ciro. Um, Goodfellas. Was that an accurate depiction or was that more fiction? Very accurate. Very accurate. Um, now, 1990 is when it came out with, again, for those who don't know, it's Ray Liotta, Robert De Niro, and some of the biggest actors in Hollywood. 30 years later, the movie's still very popular. Okay, Dave, what about you? Godfather. Oh, yeah. I mean, I saw that at 13. That, that was like being at my dad's restaurant. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that reminded me of my grandfather even more than my father because that's how my grandfather was. He was uh, sitting in a chair, giving out advice, calm. He wasn't a gangster at all. He was totally against it. But uh, uh, he was. Yeah, I believe that was for the time. For the time, of course, it's it's dated now, of course. But for the seventies, yes, I think it was very accurate. Okay, Nobody got all that gold, Dave. <laughs> Did you hear me, Dave? No, I didn't. The camera stopped. Oh, I said, I said, nobody still ever found that gold. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ciro, what about The Sopranos? Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, look, the shows that are, are basically based on true people, true events, they're usually accurate. And especially if they're going to succeed, you know, I mean, the, the Sopranos was great because obviously Goldafini was great, you know, and, um, they had some interesting characters and stuff like that. But, you know, as a representation of how, and when I say accurate, I'm talking about street life. Cause like I said, I don't, I don't like to confirm or deny any type of, of that, you know, stuff that goes allegedly goes on, but street life, you know, it's pretty accurate, you know, how rackets are run, you know? So, you know, Sopranos, yeah, it was pretty accurate cause it was based on some people that, that were real, but a lot of it was, you know, they took creative uh, liberties with stuff, you know? So Yeah, because that was a series. So, you know, yeah. they had to keep it going and be creative. Very good. What about, um, and I'll kick it to you, Dave. What about Casino? Yeah, I would say, that was, you know, again, like Ciro said, they're based on accuracy. But, of course, that's Hollywood, I would think, more than the others you just talked about. Mm -hmm. Casino was more, more Hollywood, uh, I think. Um, okay. okay, I got two more for you. Ciro, what about the Bronx Tale? Bronx Tale is uh, probably very accurate in regards to how the corner operation happened, you know, with the social club and the whole, you know, everybody sitting out on the sidewalk type of thing with, you know, the little family affairs and stuff. Uh, very, very uh, true depiction of the way things were on the streets in New York at a different periods of time. And last one for you, Dave, um, Donnie Brasco. Well, yeah, that was that was pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty accurate. Wow, no, but, wow, that's that's fascinating. Now, um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk more about the film industry and um, what you have upcoming and what we can look forward to from you. Let's start off with you, Dave. Um, I mean, you know, being in COVID-19, um, you do a lot of watching more um, television and movies, binging on this and binging on that. Um, you've been pretty busy. So one yes, thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pick up your book because I'm really want to do some great reading. So I want to pick up your book, but also I want to hear about what you have upcoming. Yes. Well, speaking of that, we have this, which, you know, ironically started writing this project after Silent Partners was so successful. These very uh, nice gentlemen from New York came and asked me to help them write their project about the doctor I told you about, this uh, Dr. Minch who goes diabolical. He, he goes in criminally insane, but no one knows but him. And basically does a really good run on taking over the underworld in South Florida. Um, so much so a federal task force is after him, the five families are after him, and a whole bunch of other people are after him. Um, and, and, and that's coming up. I hope to work with Cyril on that. Hopefully he'll, he'll be Dr. Minch, which would make it even better. Uh, for early 2021, but 
in that uh, story, people were wearing masks. There's a plague. And that started before the plague even got here. And it was, it was a uh, creative idea of the three of us, the gentleman from New York and myself. So it was just really weird to see something that we started uh, actually happen in a way. I mean, minus the doctor, of course. <laughs> and then late next year, I have what I hope will be the next Godfather, a star zero for sure, myself. And it's called The Last Dissociation. And it's about a mob war gone bad in the streets of Miami. And it's going to be a real Sam Peck and Paw, shoot them up, bang, bang. Uh, what it would be like if that really happened uh, on those streets between these type of people. And I'm really excited about that. We get to have a lot of fun with that one. And I hope that would be like a modern day Godfather. Well, now, is it going to be like three parts like Godfather? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're already <laughs> ahead of the game with the idea. Yes. But the first one has to be good. And it, it's going to be a doozy. It's going to be a doozy. There's a lot of real events that took place in Miami incorporated into the fiction. It is a fictional story, unlike um, the book I wrote about my father. Um, but it is based on things that actually happened that were put into the uh, mix for the story. So I'm going to be a driver in that movie as well, right? Well, I was thinking more like a hitman or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a classic turtleneck like in the 70s. I'm there you go. Put that. the chain and some shades. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad. I'm glad to do that. Now, what about you, Ciro? Um, you have so much going on. Tell us a little bit about what you have going on. But before that, um, did, did you put your or are you planning on putting your life in a book? Um, my life is uh, pretty much in a book on Facebook. I mean, I'm very... I'm very interactive with my fan base. I think that's why my fan base is so large and so rabid. Um, I pretty much, there's nothing that people don't know about me. I mean, even for me laying in a hospital with tubes coming out of me three three months ago, where I almost died from diverticulitis. But, um, you know, so I don't know that I'll ever, I'm not a book guy, that's Dave's department. But, um, you know, I make shows and I'm very good at it and I'm picking up a lot of steam with it. We just, uh, we got a couple of big deals that um, I'm negotiating now as we speak for Silent Partners. Uh, Mob King is already signed. That's a $5 million per episode budget. Um, it's just making history. I'm the first person that's ever wrote us, wrote us, come up with a show, created a show about things that I know about in the life of you know, the way the beats of Miami work in the streets and then star in it. And I've won, you know, in the last two months, over 50 best actor awards for all four of my projects in the film festival circuit. So that's bringing me a lot of attention. And now my uh, Mob King and uh, Silent Partners and Suitcasing uh, Prison Comedy are now before the Academy Awards to see if they get selected or in the, and in the running for awards there as well. So a lot of big stuff happening with that. And you know, I produce content and I'm looking for content deals, which is what the American film market was just passed this past week in California. That's where we put all our projects in. And uh, from there, that's where all the distributed deals are coming from and all the negotiations that are taking place right now as we speak. And uh, basically, I'm looking to produce content at a streaming company where Dave will bring his ideas and my other partners, Jay Bishop, Anthony Carone, Jokes, Yanez. And other people who create, you know, I'm, I want to open up channels for people to create stuff through my company, Serial Deposio Productions, and uh, that's what we do. So it's looking very positive. You got a lot of great things going on. I, I would recommend definitely doing a um, book on your life. It's very fascinating. It's a, it's a movie and it's just a little things that you've um, spoke about. But let's talk a little bit about your ailment. You said you were in the hospital with tubes all in you um, three months ago. Yeah, three and a half months ago, I got out. Now, what happened? I got a uh, diverticulitis perforated. Um, basically, it was leaking uh, contents into my bloodstream, you know, from, uh, I guess it's a common thing that people get, but because of where I was at in Spain, they didn't diagnose it and they just gave me pain medicine. And a couple of weeks later, I had a raging uh, infection and almost died. Then um, I caught sepsis from after the operation. So I battled several different infections, 12% survival rate and uh, came out of it, lost 60 pounds, gained it all back already. And, um, you know, just keep on moving. <laughs> Didn't miss a beat. How are you doing now? I'm doing great. Good, great, great Dave to hear that. Me. 
I can crush a, a potato with my biceps. <laughs> <laughs> Great to hear that, that you're well. Um, yeah. Now, I, I have a couple more questions for you, gentlemen, and then I'll let you off the hook. I really appreciate you all taking time on the Sherrod Show. This is um, quite fascinating. A lot of comments and questions for you all. Um, right now as I'm speaking to you. Now, Dave, I'm going to throw this one to you um, really quickly. Now, Dave, what kind of recommendations, uh, what kind of advice would you give someone? You know, there's a lot of kids out there that are fascinating about being a gangster, being this and being that. What kind of advice would you give these youngsters out here who think they want to smoke? Yeah, no. I mean, you know, Cyril can tell you far better than I. Like, I was protected uh, by my father, by guardian angels. That's the only reason I'm still here. Uh, but that road only leads to prison, death, or a very, very sad life. No one ever came out of that good that became a real gangster. My father was one of the lucky ones. He died in his sleep. But most of them don't. He died in his sleep a free man. Most of them die behind bars or in a very violent way. Um, I would suggest they use that, that energy into creativeness, you know. Think about ideas. Do, you know, books. Write scripts. Uh, believe in yourself as a creative person and be a gangster like that. And that's what I have graduated to uh, at this point in my life. And I'm so thankful to be here. And I, I definitely attribute a lot to Ciro uh, for the success I'm having now for motivating me and inspiring me to do it. But he paid a dear price for that 20 years of his life in prison, uh, losing a lot of loved ones along the way during that time. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, write songs, sing, rap, dance, uh, be creative, be a creative gangster and, and make money that uh, they don't come at five o'clock in the morning and take away from you along with your whole world and you, uh, because that's what happens. Even if you become a successful gangster, five o'clock in the morning, it's all over with that one knock at the door. Wow. And what about you, Cyril? What kind of advice would you give? Exactly what he said. Don't do it. The government, the government racketeering laws take every single thing from you and make you responsible for every single person that's under you. Um, there's, there's no way to come back from that when you get hit with it. Every single thing that you're, the, the problem with being labeled as an organized crime individual or a gang member, gang members are really targeted these days, is that anything that you do, no matter how legit, sorry about the noise, um, no matter how legit anything you do, if you're labeled as a gang member, that's an illegal enterprise. Doesn't matter if it's a legal restaurant, doesn't matter if it's a legal sports bar. If you are a recognized gang member, organized crime member, whatever, your business is illegal by definition, and they'll take it from you. It's a racket. Wow. Wow. Um, now, last question for both of you all. Um, you know, originally being born and raised in Chicago, I grew up hearing about Al Capone. Al Capone, Al Capone. Now, was he considered a true blue gangster? You want me to answer? Yes, sir. Through and through. One of the greatest to ever do it. And what a lot of people don't understand about Al Capone is he was so well loved because he gave so much to the community. He started soup kitchens at the time of the depression. Nobody else was doing that. He fed hungry people. He gave back to the community. Was he a bad guy? Did he, did he orchestrate some hits that brought a lot of uh, bad blood to him? Yeah, once you, you know, the Valentine Day massacre, that's when the government really had to find a way to put him away. And that's why the trumped up charges of tax evasion got him. It was the same thing with Gotti when you, when you take somebody out before Christmas in the streets of New York, when the streets are crowded and there's a bloody person laying in the street, all hell is going to break loose. Everybody in the government is going to want to put an end to it. And that's why guys operated, you know, with the, with the belief that you needed to be quiet and under the radar. And what about you, Dave? I loved uh, Al Capone. I mean, not for the bad things he did, but people don't know he fed hundreds of people, uh, he started food banks and soup kitchens uh, during the Great Depression. I did a lot of good you don't hear about. So I'm sure he, you know, was guilty of bad things. But hey, everybody has a good and bad side. I, I liked Al Capone. But the guy I have to, and not because he was good friends with my father, but just looking at all the history, and I've analyzed the underworld and organized crime. Believe me, I've, I've really analyzed it especially now that I'm creating creative projects because I want to 
show things that maybe people didn't know about. Uh, Al Capone had a brother, by the way, that was killed by the police. Uh, people don't know that, a younger brother. He was, he was killed protecting Al. He jumped in front of the, the bullets for Al. So things like that. But Carlo Gambino, uh, like my father, was so under the radar and laid back and, and, and that little smile on his face. Uh, I would have to say he would be the one that I would admire more than any of them, even Al, because very calm, cool, collective. And uh, you never heard a bad word about the man, even today. Wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. Well, gentlemen, can I, um, can I you tell you heard? who my favorite was real quick? Who was that? Tony Accardo, the big tuna. Why is that, Ciro? He was a genius. He started out as, they called him Joe Batters because he was Al Capone's bodyguard. And the scene that you see in The Untouchables um, where Capone hits the guy over the head with the bat, that was actually Joe Batters that did that, not Al Capone. He was famous for doing that. But more importantly, when Frank Nitti was going to get indicted and he went and killed himself and Accardo took over the outfit, the rain and the power that the outfit materialized as an entity all was specifically because of Tony Accardo all the way up until he died in the 2000s I think it was 2002 um, just a miraculous run a, a stealth businessman he spent one night in prison for tax evasion and got out the next day and never went to prison and never had any problems orchestrated the hit on Sam Giancana which was damn near impossible that's why Giancana was so comfortable letting somebody in the door so he's just an amazing individual. And if you, if you, anybody out there don't know anything about who the big tuna is, Joe Batters, Tony Accardo, look him up, man. He's a fascinating story. Have they, and, they, and now he's, he was on The Untouchables. Have they ever done a mafia movie just about him? About the big tuna? Yes. Um, no. Hmm, they should. Well, I, I would think you should at some point. Um, I'll, play his side, I'll play his sidekick, Luna, Little Tuna. A little <laughs> antidote to that. I learned from Facebook, his famous saying was a fish that keeps its mouth closed never gets caught. <laughs> That's a great saying. What a saying. <laughs> wow. But you know what? You know what a lot of other people say about that, though? The, mm. the young street people, they'll say, yeah, but he never eats either. Hmm. Hmm. So. Interesting thought. Well, um, Ciro, starting with you, where can my new fans that is watching right now, where can they A, follow you now on Instagram, Facebook, social media handles, as well as if they want to audition for one of your films? Ciro DePaggio at Facebook, Ciro DePaggio on Instagram. Um, they can really, they can see Mob King, the, the original web series. They can see everything on Facebook. I, I put everything on Facebook. Great. Follow him. You'll see it on your screen right now. Follow him on Facebook. Um, and as well as Instagram, he's doing some big, big things. So proud of what you're doing. And I, I, I hope Thank and you. pray that your Sherrard show can help you along and be a part of you. whatever you're doing in a great big Appreciate way. It. As well as you, Dave, um, where can your fans, all those who are chatting me right now, where can they be able to uh, reach out to you and follow you from here on out? Uh, Instagram, Fat Dave Capo. And they can see all the uh, pictures and information about, about the book. You know, gentlemen, I want to, it's been an honor having you on the show. I really appreciate you taking your time out on this Sunday evening to be on the Sherrard Show. You have my support and gratitude. You have given great advice um, and wisdom to those who are watching. And I continue, I pray and, and hope and pray that you all continue in the success that you're doing. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, for those who missed it, you can always watch it again on Comcast NBC. This episode will be airing on Comcast NBC next week. Check your local listings. It's going to be 5 o'clock Pacific time, 8 o'clock Eastern time. And if you miss it on Comcast NBC, you can always listen to it on iHeartRadio, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you all, gentlemen. I hope you have a great evening in the meantime. And we'll see you on tomorrow's episode where we have Miss LaShonda Williams stopping by, Cat Williams, as well as Mr. Mike Tyson. So we'll see you then. In the meantime, have a great evening. Bye-bye now. <laughs> Thanks, Sherrod. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.